Hello, I'm Diana Thomas. And I'm Tom Harper. Welcome to that Wilbur Smith Show. A podcast about the historical, geographical, natural and human background to the world of Wilbur Smith. A single wild pheasant flew up the side of the hill, almost brushing the tips of the grass in its flight. It drooped its wings and hung its legs as it reached the crest, and then dropped into cover. Two boys and a dog followed it up from the valley. The dog led with its tongue flopping pink from the corner of his mouth, and the twins ran shoulder to shoulder behind him. Both of them were sweating in dark patches through their khaki shirts, for the African sun still had heat although it stood half-mast down the sky. That was the first paragraph of When the Lion Feeds, uh, Wilbur Smith's first published novel. And in this episode of the podcast, we're going to be taking a deep dive into this book. Uh, So first up, we should warn you, there are spoilers ahead. We are going to be talking you through the plot, um, the characters, uh, the events and the unfolding of the story. So uh, if you haven't read the novel, first of all, what have you been doing with your life? And second of all, um, you may want to look away now. So is this the first time for you, I mean, as a podcast um, presenter? Uh, yeah, this is my very first time. I've listened to plenty of podcasts um, and never, ever dipped my toe in the water. So this is very much a baptism of fire. And my toe is likewise being dipped. Be- before we jump in, I guess people may be wondering, why is it you and me, Diana, talking about this book? Well, good question. Um, Well, I knew Wilbur for the best part of 30 years, I suppose. Um, We first met when I interviewed him um, on the publication of The Seventh Scroll. And then I interviewed him a couple of more times after that, um, once for a newspaper and another time live on stage at the National Theatre. And he was then a kind of a mentor and a guide and support to me when I was working on my first thriller under my own pen name of Tom Kane. Um, and was a huge help for them. And since then, I was lucky enough to co-write with him um, Predator, which was one of the Hector Cross books, and then a trilogy, the War Cry trilogy, which is um, War Cry, Courtney's War, and Legacy's War, which follows the story of Saffron Courtney from her birth um, through to the mid-1960s. Brilliant. So you've been uh, working with him, obviously, for a long time. Uh, I met him much later in his life, so I uh, am an author and I've been working for, I guess, about 15 years uh, writing my own novels. And then I was playing squash one evening uh, and I came off the squash court and I had a text message saying, call your agent immediately, uh, which was pretty surprising. First of all, because my agent never uses her mobile phone because she's quite old school. Uh, and second of all, because she has never in the 20 years we have been working together ever had Uh, something so urgent that it needed to be passed on at seven o'clock on a Monday evening. Uh, So I rang her straight away uh, and she said, Wilbur Smith's people have been in touch uh, and they want to meet with you. Uh, And that, as they say, was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. So like you, I came in to work with Wilbur on co-writing some novels, in this case, in the Courtney, uh, in the early part of the Courtney series. Uh, So the first one was uh, The Tiger's Prey, uh, which is sort of fits in between Monsoon and Blue Horizon. Uh, And after that, uh, and this is germane to to this podcast, uh, we were working on filling in the gap between Blue Horizon, which ends in the 1730s, and When the Lion Feeds, uh, which starts um, in 1876. So Wilbur had written When the Lion Feeds, then he'd taken the Courtney's forwards. Uh, Then he jumped back and did the prequel trilogy of uh, Birds of Prey, uh, Monsoon and Blue Horizon. Uh, And our project was really to fill in uh, those missing 150 years between the two uh, instances of the Courtney's. Uh, And as part of that project, we've published Ghostfire, uh, Stormtide uh, and Nemesis, which is the most recent one. Um, And so I've been doing that with him. and, and now on his behalf, since uh, about 2015. Yeah, I mean, I think I started uh, about, t- about 20, 
2013, I think I first started work on Predator. I should also say that the, um, if anyone hasn't read them, the Saffron Courtney books take her story through the Second World War. Um, so that was another kind of filling in the gaps because there had not been any Courtney the Courtney stories. There had been stories based on the First World War, but not the Second. So um, that was another, uh, and actually a fascinating, I'm sure you find it too, absolutely fascinating exercise to place those characters and, and also to work with characters like Santaine Courtney, who had been an absolute heroine of mine, and to take wonderful characters he had created them and, and weaved weave them into new books was a was a real thrill. Yeah, it is like it is like jumping into someone else's sandbox uh, and picking up all their wonderful toys uh, and and kind of making up, um, getting to you know, develop stories. With yes, them. exactly. So anyway, here we are at the very beginning of that literary story. And perhaps at this point, Tom, we should give a quick summation of When the Lion Feeds for um, anyone who hasn't read it. Uh, yeah, we definitely should. So it begins in Natal province in South Africa in 1876. Uh, and the two boys in the passage you read are the Courtney twins, Sean and Garrick, uh, who are hunting on their father's uh, great ranch, uh, Thunis Kral. And the story really follows uh, particularly one of them, Sean Courtney, who is the stronger, more active, uh, and more adventurous of the two brothers, uh, and his uh, brother, his twin, Garrick, who is much more of an um, introverted, solitary, uh, bookish type. Uh, and after a tragic accident, uh, Garrick really is uh, confined to the farm, uh, and Sean, through a series of um, dramatic events, goes off to seek his fortune, first of all in the Zulu Wars, uh, then across the mountains, uh, prospecting for gold during the great South African gold rush, and then on across the frontier into sort of uncharted lands north of the Limpopo, where he discovers the uh, the, the trials uh, and excitement of big game hunting. It's a massive story of fortunes won and lost, of women won and lost, of loyalty, of betrayal, all the hallmarks of uh, Wilbur's writing. Indeed it is. And it introduces us to the Courtney family, whose saga will go on to become the longest running family saga in publishing history. So anyway, here's Wilbur Smith, a trainee accountant, and working for the tax system in, in Rhodesia, as it was then called, um, has written, having had his first book turned down, to his great surprise, the second one gets picked up. And I think that in that first paragraph, there's just so much that is like a seed from which all these huge 50 plus novels will come. I mean, you've got, it begins with a na an observation of the natural world, which is just so well, a, sing a single pheasant. And you get a very, strong sense that he, he knows exactly what a pheasant looks like when it's flying up a hill. Then you have two boys, they're twins, they're brothers. You sort of kind of have implicit in that the kind of relationship stroke conflict they're going to have. And then right at the end is the absolutely key word, African. Because if there is one thing that Wilbur Smith was above all, it was the absolute kind of poet laureate, if a poet laureate can write novels, but the, the kind of the novelist of the 20th century about Africa, certainly, certainly in terms of his public impact and sales. Yeah, and in fact, one, I think one of the interesting things about this book is that it came out in 1964, which I believe is the year after the movie Zulu. Um, and I think that part of what um, contributed to the success of the book, other obviously than its, its merits, uh, was the fact that there was this sudden interest um, and in uh, in the UK, certainly, in, um, in things African. Um, and it sort of fed that. And as you say, he just sort of took that and ran with it in his career, as, as you say, becoming kind of the laureate of Africa and writing across. We, we, we've talked about you know, you're in the Second World War, I'm uh, in sort of the 1830s Africa. And, but obviously, Wilbur's gone back to like the 1680s. So this extraordinary sweep of African history that he's, um, he's written about. Anyhow, so the two little boys who are running up that hill are Sean and Garrick Courtney, who are 
again, there's a family that's going to be part of the will be universe historically through time and also in terms of the years over which the novels have been written. So I guess we need to start with the two brothers, Sean and Garrick. And I had a thought about them, which I then had confirmed by reading On Leopard Rock, Wilbur's autobiography, but I'm not going to... That is a spoiler alert, what I thought thought was. But I just wonder what you made of them as characters, Tom. I mean, when you were, when you were rereading or reading them, because they kind of are the foundational characters of the Courtney. Yes. And again, you talked about, you know, the seeds of everything that follows are contained in these opening pages or opening paragraph. And that's very, there's not, not, never more true than in these two characters. Um and you've got these two brothers who are twins, but actually they're clearly not, they're not identical twins uh, because the way they're described, Sean is bigger, stronger. I mean, described in very overtly classically masculine terms, um, whereas Garrick is weaker um, and slighter, sort of more diminutive. Um, there's various, you know, <laughs> Sean is hairier um, and, and, and Garrick is not. Um, Sean is a man of action, he's a doer. Um, he's you know a crack shot, a great hunter, uh, and Garrick actually is uh, much more interested in books um, and and uh, intellectual pursuits. Uh, and in a sense, they're they're two halves of of a whole, really. Um, and and this is a classic Wilbur technique: is to sort of just slightly amplify differences that exist within each of us, um, but then to, to dramatize them uh, and and to create this conflict. But I think the thing that actually struck me when I reread it recently was how, although clearly Sean is the hero and he goes on to become the protagonist of the book, uh, and he is you know a very archetypal man's man, but Garrick gets a lot of sympathy. He was more sympathetic than I remembered from my sort of memory of the book, having read it a while ago. I don't know if you found that. Yeah, I mean, I, I get, I get, I'm going to I'm going to wreck the spoiler because because when I was reading it, what struck me, the thought I had was, are they both Wilbur? And that's true. And I think that what's really interesting about Garrick and Sean is that they is that they actually portray two parts of Wilbur, which are. On the one hand, the kind of ma- the man of action, you know, the great the hunter, the you know, very publicly going out and sort of into the wild and what have you, and and yet on the other hand, and that's kind of his father's influence. And then on the other hand, you have the bookish, the, the little boy who grew up to be a writer, and and I think that 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 duality, um, it, it, and you're right, Garrick is kind of simple you kind of have the feeling that he's going to turn out to be a villain although it doesn't play out in this book which is another interesting thing about the book but he is sympathetically treated and and you i mean i felt terrible for him because okay let's let's explain why the two little boys are are out one day and um, I think Sean has taken his father's rifle without his father's permission, if I'm right. Isn't that- yeah, it's the, it's, the, it's the shotgun. Uh, you know, in, in the Wilbur universe, we, we have to be very, very precise about these things. And, and, and what happens is that Sean fires the shotgun accidentally, hits Garrick in his leg, and Garrick basically loses the lower half of, I think, his right leg. Is that right? Anyway, one of his legs. And so is sort of disabled and is therefore weakened even further. So he's not just the smaller brother who's running after the other one. He can't even run. And, and Sean becomes bigger and more and more macho. And the distinction between them grows even more acute. And I just, and, and I mean, this is a mark of the writing. I, I just felt so sorry for that little boy who through absolutely no fault of his own has had the rest of his life and his character marked by this awful accident. Yeah, and I think actually I just wanted to read out where that happens because, again, I think this really illustrates the way Wilbur works. Um, So this is, again, still in that first scene um, and they've just um, shot this in Conquer, um, which is uh, some kind of bushbuck, and and he so Sean's running to to get to the carcass and Gary's in the opposite. Uh, Gary's been chasing the deer. Sean's been shooting at it. And so Gary's running towards him. Sean's, Sean's running in the opposite direction. Uh, Sean ran down to join them. 
A stone rolled under his foot and he fell. The shotgun flew out of his hand and the second barrel fired. The sound of the explosion was very loud. When Sean scrambled onto his feet again, Garrick was sitting in the grass whimpering, whimpering and staring at his leg. And that's it. You know, and then, then, then you find out what's happened to it. But it's that there's no, it's so matter of fact. It's just Sean's running, he trips, the gun shoots. It, and it's that matter of factness with the brutality of life that Garrick and Sean's lives change in an instant. But there's no dramatic build up. There's no uh, ominous foreshadowing. There's just, it happens. And it's like that it's changed yes it's can i just say that that um it, it i think it says something and i and i i mean about both of us brits that you go mm, it's, it's some kind of bushba uh, me too i would feel the same thing where of course wilbur would know exactly what kind of bush bucket was and what its mating habits were and where it liked to feed and all that kind of stuff and how you would describe it and um but yes and i, I actually fun enough this book in particular i was i was i, I was struck by how um economical it is in its writing. I mean, Wilbur was a great fan of Ernest Hemingway, who was the ultimately economical writer. Um, um, and, and actually compared with his later books, it is, I think, much more matter of fact. It's much more, you know, a sentence. There are some, there are some very, very powerful metaphors. There's one, one about a, um, a, a river twisting across the landscape. Sorry, so going across the landscape like a twisted gut, which I thought was a wonderful line of wonderful description. But but it, it's it's very much a first book in that respect. Um, in, and he's just you're right. He just tells things very very directly, very simply. Not a huge amount of kind of poetic, in fact, no poetic writing, but it's very powerful and very gripping. And, and, and it's, that's something which you either have or you don't have. He just was able to grab you. And, and the moment he set up that thing, right there at the beginning of the book, you kind of know, oh my God, this is just going to be this huge episode. And as I say, I just felt, for, and, and, as, and as that little boy's suffering continued, and meanwhile, Sean gets bigger and stronger and more macho and more girls throw themselves at him as poor Garrett can't get anyone to save his life and then becomes drunk and impotent and goodness knows what. I, there was actually a point where I had to put the book down because I was just like, I can't bear this. I just can't bear this poor kid's suffering. It was just, as a parent, I think almost, I just I just found it really hard, which is actually a mark of the writing. I had to make myself like, fuck up, go back and read it. Yeah, and actually, I think what's even more extraordinary is despite having had his legs shot off by his um, larger twin, uh, he still hero worships his brother um, and he still craves nothing more than his brother's approval uh, and love. It's, which, which, which again makes Garrick, I think, very sympathetic that actually um, he still has this, this brotherly yearning uh, inside him, uh, which, which, which we, as you say, we, we just sympathise so deeply. Yes. One of the things that also is interesting about the book, so by the time, for example, it, I'm thinking of like Birds of Prey, first of the very early Courtney books set at sea, the way Wilbur would start a book would be to let you know very, very quickly who the good guy was, who the bad guy was, or bad girl, and what the jeopardy our hero was going to be, or our heroes were going to be, was. One of the interesting things about this, because it's, an, an, if you like, kind of a naive book, is it, it doesn't have a, a tremendous amount of, of evident authorial technique. In other words, it sets up this this duality this kind of Cain and Abel thing and you think oh that's what this book is going to be all about but actually it isn't because you have a whole series of scenes where the two brothers grow up and they kind of go through school and then kind of Sean leaves home and he goes off to find his fortune and you sort of think oh, well he's going to come back to Garrick but actually it really doesn't <laughs> it just and then it becomes this and it's and it's really extraordinary because at no point there are bad things happen to Sean and there is one bad person who for reasons we'll come on to may be seen as problematic in current terms but really it's just a series of adventures 
and again, sort of spoiler alert, ending tragically. But, but the fact that there isn't, as it were, the formal, here's the good guy, here's the bad guy, here's the jeopardy, doesn't matter because you are absolutely taken along this story, which I guess we now better relate what the story is. Yeah, although I think it's interesting that you say there's no obvious authorial technique because I read it as the the lack of technique is the technique, um, in a sense, that it's this very plainly written, uh, sort of superficially, um, as you say, superficially naive, but actually um, the, the depth is there, sort of disguised by this very plain spoken way of presenting it. I think the depth also comes from the fact that from the very first page, you know that this is being written by somebody who, if he describes what a landscape looks like, he knows what that landscape looks like. If he describes what it's like to be near a lion at night, it's because he knows. If he describes this is what an elephant looks like as it's being shot, this is what... I mean, every single detail, talk about, write about what you know. (laughs) This is the ultimate example of it. This is somebody who has just sat down and written a story that he absolutely understands every element of it from beginning to end. And I think that's where the power of the book comes because it's just unmistakable. You, you know it's not being faked. You know, you know, well, this is written long before the years of Wikipedia, but I mean, you know, we have all researched books nowadays through Wikipedia or, you know, through cuts or through maps or through reading other books. This is not researched in that way. This is lived. And, and, I, and, and that's why it's, inc- and, and one of the things that Wilbur had was an incredibly vivid, natural way for describing nature whether it's the plumage on a bird or the smell of an animal or the, or the sight of a landscape. He, uh, without, again, any great fuss, he just had the knack of putting you right there. And, and this, that, that quality is absolutely present in When the Lion Feeds. You feel absolutely in that environment. Yeah, that's, that's definitely part of his gift. Um... Just going back to something you said about how the opening of it is slightly is different than what you'd expect in in, in one of the later novels in terms of setting up antagonists, you know, peril. Um, I think it's it's not it's true of all his books because actually Monsoon starts very similarly with with brothers um, sort of larking about, um, and again you get the sense of, of the of the of the the way the relationships are going to play out. Um, in in those sort of early um, sort of childhood interactions, uh, and that's a book which doesn't actually reveal what the ultimate kind of um, goal is going to be until about page five hundred, because um, <laughs> so it's uh, very. But I think we think of Wilbur as an adventure writer. Of course, he is. He's the adventure writer. Um, but when the Lion Feeds isn't, it's not a thriller um, or even a kind of classic adventure novel like King Solomon's Mines or something, which obviously was a great inspiration to Wilbur. I mean, it's really a coming of age story, isn't it? This is the story of Sean Courtney coming of age. Um, and I think if you understand it in that genre or that frame, then the story makes more sense in a way that it doesn't if you're expecting a kind of tale where we set out to find the diamonds and at the end of it, we defeated the villains and found the diamonds. I, I wasn't in any way disappointed. I, I, that was the, the, the thought of, 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 of it not having the kind of conventional structure was one which struck me in retrospect. As I was reading, I was just wanted to know what happened next. Yeah, I mean, yeah that's it. Because, I mean, you know, this is a story, you mentioned Zulu. I mean, there's a kind of, it, it happens at the time of Rourke's Drift, which is what they, what, it sort of big, earlier scenes take place at the time of Rourke's Drift, which is what, where the film Zulu is set, where the small number of, British soldiers were surrounded by the Zulu and and they had this epic battle there. Uh, and Garrick sort of sort of un, sort of becomes a bit of a hero at Rourke's Drift, and that's a sort of idea which is picked up and then sort of discarded to some extent. But you're right, you just follow Sean and and he does have great triumphs and great losses, two really massive losses. Um and, and again I'd forgotten how the book ends, and I was completely not expecting it. I mean, I just, you know, it was, it took, and it's very powerful again. So we ought to go through exactly what his adventures are. I suppose. Yeah. 
So as we said, this is a coming of age story. And certainly the opening sections of the book are very much a young man growing up. So we start in 1876, when I think Sean is 14 years old. Um, and then we get a fairly whistle-stop tour, actually a sequence I really love, um, where he talks about um, the a, a young man's life as a river. Um, and it's the sort of extended metaphor where he says, you know, sometimes there were rapids, sometimes there were whirls and eddies, sometimes there were great waterfalls. Um, and we see Sean, um, you know, the, 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 the landmarks in his life, he's given his first gun, um, he uh, has his first kind of sexual encounters, uh, and actually he he learns to stand up to his father. And I think this is a fascinating scene um, where w- the ultimate mark of the, almost the, the, the end of the sequence is where uh, Will, uh, Sean's father um, swing the weight to Courtney, uh, who's a real kind of South African man's man, um, kind of swings at him and Sean punches back and lays his father out, even though his hand is broken. Uh, and that's, in a sense, the culmination of his coming of age. So the, um, the, the, the dynamic, the father-son dynamic, which again is obviously absolutely crucial to so many of Wilbur's books, uh, is really played out very strongly there. Well, what's interesting about that, though, of course, is that there's a point where, where in that, what, so, so the father thinks that he sort of is outwitted his, his father is this tough guy and therefore been in a million brawls. So he thinks he's outwitted his, his son because um, Sean has, has essentially smashed the knuckles of his right hand against his father's skull with this punch, which although it's hurt his father, has then broken his right hand. So the father thinks, okay, I've got him now. And Sean is just in such a rage and is such a man's man that even though his hand is broken, he then goes and beats the living daylights out of his father. But the really interesting thing about this is that his father is kind of pleased about that. Yeah, yeah. It's not like, yeah. okay, you're banned from the house. It's, oh, okay, now you really are a man. And now we've just established some kind of mutual respect on a, on a whole new level that was not there before. So although Sean has to leave, it, well, which is to do more with his feelings about Garrick and the fact that Garrick has married Sean's girl, uh, well, okay, I'm trying to think why Sean is not there so that, so that Garrick has the time to marry uh, Anna. Yeah, well, this, is, this comes to the Zulu War, yes. um, which we're actually going to be talking about in much more depth with historian Saul David in a future episode. Um, but we should probably go into it a little bit now. So we, we've jumped from 1876 to 1879. Sean is now, I guess, 17. Um, and the Zulu War breaks out. I think we should say in the interests of historical accuracy, the Zulu War is um, kind of instigated by the British because they decided it's time to, to teach the Zulus a lesson. Um, and Turns out that wasn't the lesson that was taught. Well, well, in, indeed, uh, you, you, you know, be, be careful when starting a war because it may not go the way you planned. Um, but a volunteer um, militia, I guess they are, uh, is is raised from among the local farmers, uh, and Sean and Wait, his father, ride off to war um, to, in, in support of the British army. Uh, and this is obviously one of the key kind of turning points uh, in their life. In fact, in all three of their lives, Gary stays behind because he. Uh, does, you know, is missing a leg. Like, sorry, Gary goes with them despite the fact that he is missing a leg. Um, but then, when they're camped out in in Zululand, uh, Sean goes off with a scouting party um, and is therefore away from the main body of the army. Uh, Gary stays behind at Rourke's Drift, which is a medical station. It was it's a mission center, but it's being used as a medical center. Um, and Waite goes on with the main body of Lord Chelmsford's army to a place called Isandwala. Yes, uh, and, and, and of course there, the Brits are massacred by the Zulu. And the Ga- Garrick, who's, who's, who's been sort of left behind with all the sick people because he's just too wet in the weed, kind of wakes up after the night of Rourke's Drift, of sort of the siege of Rourke's Drift, to discover that he's become a hero. And I think it's been recommended for the BC. Whereas, and Sean is off, are they tracking cattle, I think, aren't they? They're yes, kind of... they've, that's right. They're, um, yeah, they're looking because the Zulu have driven away all their cattle um, to uh, 
so that they're not in the way for the war, basically. Uh, and so the, uh, the this commando goes after them to try and f- find the cattle, and they fall into a Zulu ambush. Um, and again, one of, one of the things that's true of basically the whole of African history uh, in that part of the world, whether it's we're talking about you know Zulus, Xhosas, uh, whites, you know Anglo Anglo farmers, Boer farmers, is that basically they all you know, cattle is the currency, and they're constantly raiding across each other's borders yeah. to steal each other's cattle. Um, and uh, the Courtney's are no different in that respect. Yes, and and the, the other thing is that that when so I, I think I've got this right now, that when Sean leaves to go off to war, his girlfriend uh, Anna turns out to be pregnant. Yes, and Garrick then re- returns before Sean and marries Anna, um, in order to give her a husband so that the baby is not born illegitimate. Yes, and because Wait is actually killed, uh, the father, at Isandwala, Sh- Sean is presumed dead in this ambush somewhere out in the bush. Um, Gary returns the hero, and of course, because his father and his brother are dead, and because we're obviously in a very patriarchal society, his, poor Ada, the mother, gets no say in the inheritance. Uh, the farm is left, uh, you know, Wait had left the farm to Sean and Gary, uh, Sean is dead, so Gary inherits the whole farm. So Anna, uh, who it was Sean's girlfriend, uh, it's kind of it's interesting actually. I think the way it's written, having a father for her son isn't quite enough uh, to make her want to marry Gary because she really loathes him. Uh, but when she realizes that he's also going to be fabulously rich because he owns this huge cash- cattle farm, then she suddenly decides that uh, actually getting married to him would be no bad thing. So yes, they marry while they both think that Sean is dead. Yes, and I think Sean comes back and, and, and Anna goes off. Well, Anna goes off on her honeymoon, which is very um, swish, and they all go off to they go to Cape Town in the end. Then they live the high life, except that except that she doesn't remotely um, fancy Garrick, and he in any way is incapable of satisfying her, even if she did. So when when Sean comes back from war, alive after all. Um, she throws herself at him, and and there's another interesting, interesting um, uh, Wilbur response because instead of saying fair enough and making the best of it, he actually is disgusted that she should have done this, and that his brother's wife is throwing herself at him, and he then feels that he can't kind of be around anymore, and he must leave them to get on with it. And he gives, he basically gives his half of the farm to. To Sean, because he's now got half the to, 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 to Garrick, rather, yeah. To Garrick, sorry. And, and it's that, it's, the, it's sort of the fact that he can't face being there with, with his bastard son. Well, his, yes, it's his bastard well, Anyway, his son <laughs> being raised by, by Garrick and, and Anna that, that makes him think, I've just got to get out of here. So he takes all the money he's got and yeah. heads off to find his fortune. I mean, that's, it's a, it's a, that's, that's, that's the next stage in the, in the kind of classic coming of age quest. He, he's, he's driven away from home. Um, yeah. And, and sets out um, going north because that's the way he's facing. Um, and with no thought as to kind of what he's going to do. He's, he's got some money. He's got about 1200 pounds. I think that he's from his sort of um, in his bank account from, from his business dealings on the cattle station. I think that there's just, before we move on, because obviously that, as you say, that's this kind of the big, turning point in his life where he says I, I can't live with Gary and Anna particularly with Anna um, so he's just going to go off on his own uh, which is this great I mean talk about getting sympathy for the protagonist um, you know this, this noble act of just giving his half share of this phenomenally uh, lucrative farm to his brother who whose wife has just basically um, thrown herself at him um, and in fact she, she frames him for rape doesn't she because she um she makes it look as though she's been attacked by Sean and tells Gary that basically he's attacked her. And she actually persuades Gary to go and shoot Sean, um, which Gary uh, can't bring himself to do. Um, But Sean realizes he can't stick around. So, but I think the way that this is again, something I really admire in the way that it's written is that Sean and Anna, the way Wilbur writes Sean fancying Anna I find incredibly um, unvarnished and completely unromantic. He doesn't love her, he, but he's a young man of seventeen or eighteen, and you know he he 
basically just wants to have sex with her and once he's done that he kind of loses interest and there's this great scene where you know they have sex and then his mind instantly turns to food um because that's now what what he's interested in um and it's she's doing the whole guy you do love me don't you yeah, yeah yes and she, she's just as bad she's manipulating him like crazy um there's a there's a kind of it's not entirely fair. I'm not quite a whore and virgin thing of duality in, in Wilbur's book. But I mean, there are good girls and bad girls. But she's not a bad girl because she has sex with him. Yeah. She's a bad girl because she's manipulative and, and avaricious. Yeah. But I think, um, it's, so when she gets pregnant, in fact, it's the night before Sean goes off to war. And he um he kind of wants what you know one for the road uh, and she's like oh n- no no i don't want to i don't want to and sean says you know i might never come back this could be our last chance you wouldn't want the, you know to have sent me away needy on our the last time you ever saw me and he sort of guilt trips her into having sex with him um in the back of a wagon but i think it, it's interesting it's will was being really i mean he's been really honest about i think the way an 18 year old boy might think um and not but it you're risking making sean look unattractive but actually yeah, yeah. in wilbur's hands because he's such a skillful writer it, that doesn't happen you kind of see him more vividly because i say there there is there are these kind of contradictions and these bits of him that are, are, are not massively heroic um, but um, but you, 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 but never lose our sympathy. I think I think that it's interesting because Garrick also serves a purpose here, which is that I mean, eighteen year old boys, as much as they can be just randy little so and so's, can also be tremendously romantic in some ways more romantic than girls because women, young women, are, 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 can be a little bit more advanced than the boys emotionally and psychologically. Yeah. Um, the boys can be, if a boy falls, he really falls. Yeah. And so Garrick represents that half of the kind of teenage male psyche, which is the absolutely hopeless romantic, the kind of, and, and rather kind of faintly feeble in that. I mean, he's, he's, he's somewhat unmanned by that um, because, well, he's not, he's, he's poor, poor chap, he's, he's lost his leg. Um, so, so actually what you get is sort of two halves of, of of what you might call the, the, the complete teenage male psyche. <laughs> yes. But you're right. Some I think it's because in the end, because because Sean does this self-sacrificial thing of, of as were giving up his inheritance to go away, it kind of absolves him of his sins, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. He he leaves and what turns out to be worse is that he's he kind of forgets his mum, he forgets his brother. And that will later be shown to be if, if that if he has a failing, that is it. Um, but he then sets off, kind of with a clean slate, into his new world, you know, as a man. Yeah, uh, the one character we haven't mentioned yet, who is the only person who goes with him when he sets out, of course, is Imbajani, uh, which. I- probably not pronounced correctly so apologies to our zulu listeners um if anyone wants to write in and tell me how to pronounce it please do um so he's he is a zulu he's actually a zulu prince yes. um who is the son of a claimant to the zulu throne who's been done in by Quechua. um and he and is therefore fighting against the zulus uh, for the british when when sean's on campaign and they form this bond this is again kind of a classic wilbur idea of um the, the kind of the the the, the, the sidekick effectively yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's it's the it's the it's the the white young white hero and the often as you say noble literally noble um black um retainer who is at one and the same time kind of both the servant and the teacher yeah. so so and this this is something which will we'll come on to the question of the degree to which this book and, and Wilbur's writing as a whole is problematic, quotes unquote. Um, but it's it's a very interesting role that Amjani plays, uh, and, and as you say, one that will be repeated quite often in later books with other couples. Yeah. I mean, so a, a bowly springs to mind in the Birds of Prey and Monsoon. Again, a prince who who, as you say, is both kind of servant, but really he's there as a teacher. Manuro in Asagai, and and in the, in the and he appears in the in the Courtney trilogy, trilogy that I wrote, um, and he, it's interesting because because the one of the roles he plays is that 
he and characters like him don't know the things that their more educated, more sophisticated, more modern, more technologically advanced white partners, leaders, bosses know. But they do know things that the white guy doesn't know. Yeah. They have their own wisdom, which is often a wisdom about the natural world, or it might be a wisdom about human nature. And, and there's never a sense of inferiority. So, so they are quite, I think, well written that they are fully rounded human beings in their own right. And yes, it's true that they're placed in a servile, pseudo servile position. That's just historically accurate. It wouldn't, it could not have been the other way around, whether rightly or wrongly. It would be very strange if you wrote it the other way around. I mean, that would have been an interesting thing to do, but it would be a completely ahistorical thing. Yeah, it just occurs to me that in a way it's almost like the dynamic uh, in a very different context of um, Frodo Baggins and Sam Gamgee in Lord of the Rings. Yes. Where it, and in the book, uh, Sam is the I mean, sorry, Sam is the gardener. Uh, and in the book, it's very much a kind of, you know, Frodo's the master. He's always calling him Master Frodo. Um, and, and Sam is the servant. But actually, it's the, it's the friendship between the two that is no less than being you know no no less for, for, for them having that relationship it's just how things were in that time whereas obviously when they adapted it for the films they really play down the master servant thing and, and they're just friends it's, it's, it's bertie worcester and jeeves it's 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 sherlock holmes and dr Watson. <laughs> yeah i mean this is but in this particular case actually more so than than, than actually no it's actually it is like jeeves it's not like Dr. Watson, because Jeeves knows a tremendous amount of stuff that Bertie, yeah. Bertie Worcester doesn't know. And, and, yeah. Manu- and Manuro Stroke and Majani, th- those characters absolutely do know, I believe, do know stuff. Um, and I think that's important. And they are, and, and there's a very telling moment, actually, since we're talking about this, in When the Lion Feeds, um, in which, spoiler alert, um, Sean has made money, and we'll come to how he does that, and a great deal of money. And he decides to dress Embajani up in some swanky kind of servant's <laughs> kind of footman's livery. And, yeah. and Embajani is not happy because he regards this as being degrading. Whereas if he's just wearing his kind of loincloth and he's got his shield and he's got his spear, he feels kind of more himself and more dignified. And Sean is made to understand that Embajani is right. Yeah that he has made a terrible mistake and he's actually kind of degraded Amajani by trying to dressing him up like some absurd sort of fairy tale footman. Yeah, and it's actually, it's a reflection of the degradation of Sean's own character, um, the way he's been corrupted by his uh, his wealth. So how has he got rich, we ask ourselves? Well, we'll find out in the next episode when we explore part two of When the Lion Feeds, Witwater's Rand, The Land of the White Waters. Yes, all will be revealed then, and I do hope you'll join us for more from that Wilbur Smith show. Until then, goodbye from me, Diana Thomas. And goodbye from me, Tom Harper. Smith's show is produced by Christopher Wynn. Music by Dewey DeLay.